Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, hello. <laughs> it's a nice, friendly crowd. Good. Um, so there's a quite a varied group of us giving a, a presentation and a session now on soils. Um, our title is Sustaining Our Soils, Getting the Balance Right, Can and Should We Achieve Close Systems? Mm -hmm. So really about um, soil health, soil, soil fertility, various different uh, methods. So, so just to introduce us all, um, quite a few of us here are from Coventry University Centre for Agroecology, Water and Resilience. We've been working on a project, Organic Plus, as well as other, other projects, all around the issue of um, contentious inputs in organic agriculture. One of those being fertility from non-organic sources, so non-organic animal manure, that kind of thing. So yeah, I'm Judith and I'm, I'm based at Comfort on that project. We've got Coral Ward <laughs> joining us from EcoDiffy, who's been looking at mobile green manures, so another method about the long farm fertility. Mm -hmm. Dennis works at Coventry with us and he also looks after a, um, a vegetable farm called The Plot and has got experiences with a few other growing spaces so he's going to talk about his experiences with, with quite a variety of different situations. Francis Rains is a researcher at Coventry working on the Organic Plus project and several other soil fertility projects, You've probably quite a lot of you got to know Francis over the years, he'll be talking about that. We've got Tolly joining us. He's going to talk about carbon sequestration capabilities of the soil and also a bit about the updated uh, stock free organic standards as well. So all loosely on this theme of um, soil fertility and sustainability and with a focus on on farm derived nutrition. Um, Donna is then going to round us all up at the end and facilitate a discussion and we've got a little questions at, at the end and I've got a few questions now that I'm just going to, not questions but themes to introduce around the topic. Um, so one thing with the Organic Plus project, it's a Europe-wide project so although the UK is not in the EU at the moment and we've got change and differences there, it's still quite important to note that under the Farm to Fork strategy there is an ambition for at least 25% of the EU's agricultural land to be certified organic by 2030. So there's obviously questions around that. Where Will there be enough nutrients from acceptable sources to, to meet that need? Um, both in terms of the total amount of nutrition available, you know, with, you know can we replace all those synthetic, um, synthetic nutrients that, that are sourced? And also, do we have enough sources that are either on farm or within a short distance of farms that can be can be derived locally and have a have a lesser carbon footprint? Just to, a couple of things to illustrate the point. Our German partner in the Organic Plus project, the University of Hohenheim, they happen to be just next to a big producer of organic tofu. So in these fields here, they've been able to use tofu whey as a as a source of fertility, along with clover pellets, with, with quite quite a bit of success. And then with us quite a few of us old being um, here being old garden organic HGRA people, we have been looking at comfrey at Wrighton and we've got Dennis here preparing some of our comfrey in the wheelbarrow. I didn't ask his permission, so it's <laughs> both of so. And then just to introduce really some questions and some themes that will be covered by, by the speakers. So just around what actual levels of inputs do we require? Um, in the last session in this room, organic consumes, we did talk a little bit about, about yield and what can be expected. Um, maybe if people are in transition from conventional to organic, they might have reservations around yield. They might have an, an initial dip in yield. What can reasonably be expected? Um, and obviously, we've got issues with food waste and all kinds of discussion in the, the yield case. Um, also, to what extent does it depend on the system? Um, quite a few of the presentations we've got are going to focus on the kind of areas that are cropped more intensively. So polytunnels, glass houses, small beds with, with a quick turnover that, that would tend to have more um, organic matter, more fertility applied to them. Um, so that kind of leads on to the next question of the problems of over application. People might put lots of compost or other, other material onto a bed in order to meet the nitrogen demands of the plants, but could that lead to excesses of, of other nutrients, of other, other build-ups, other problems with, with crop rotations, that kind of thing. Um, that kind of leads into the issue of soil testing as well. If growers are able to test soil regularly, 
will that tell them are they able to test for the, you know for, for deficiencies and for excesses of certain nutrients obviously land varies a lot like the corner corner of a plot might be completely different to, to the opposite corner in, in terms of the soil composition um the, the nutrients that are present there so that kind of raises the question is it is it worth upping soil testing would it help also um are on fire on farm derived nutrients always more environmentally sustainable that they may not be they may have their own problems there may be issues with timing so you might have leaching occur so a bit of discussion around that as well and quite a biggie at the end um, the implications for grower workload to have that on farm nutrient source to have it there yes it might be handy it might be local it might not have to travel but then if it causes a 20 percent increase in work for the for the farmer then it, it might not be any good so yeah that's the, the general things that we've got um probably could have got some slide already but yeah we've got the focus on the small to medium scale horticultural systems so the the uh, polytunnels glass houses one of the big reasons that we focused on these kind of growing situations is that a lot of kind of academic work tends to have focused on larger more extensive systems so bigger bigger production scales and perhaps arable systems and another thing to note as well is um I think with, with these smaller places, with things like polytunnels and glass houses, because they are cropped intensively because of the infrastructure costs and, and because they'll bring you things like tomatoes that might not be possible outside, they tend to be the kinds of areas that are cropped intensively and so do have these larger volumes of organic matter applied to them. So, yeah, just, just a bit of information there to, to set the seed, really. And then I'm going to hand over to Chloe, who's going to talk about perennial mobile green manures. Oh, she yeah. wants this here. Yeah. No, no, not if no. I'll give you the Hello. I'm going to rearrange the furniture so I can see my story. Yeah. This okay? Can I be here? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Hello. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about perennial mobile green manures, um, and my talk's mainly about nitrogen and issues around nitrogen use efficiency and the climate change impact of nitrogen, both in its production um, and also in its use in terms of nitrogen loss and greenhouse gas emissions and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm aware that the name perennial mobile green manures is a bit long-winded and... Oh, right, how's that? Okay, so I need to stand... Okay, right, recap. My talk's mainly about nitrogen. <laughs> Perennial mobile green manures is a really ridiculously stupid long name. And if at the end of this, you can think of a better one for us, then um, please let me know. Um, so it's very much focused on climate change and nitrogen. Um, so to very basically tell you what the idea is, and this is very embryonic. There might be people doing this already in temperate areas, but I don't know of them yet. So. What I'm thinking is that if we can have a system where we grow our nitrogen in little coppice, permanent coppice areas and add the leaves to farmland, it possibly could be more efficient in certain different ways. And so I've done some research at Bangor University about this, and then we've just started another project, a local project in mid Wales. And the Bangor University Research is much more quantitative, measuring the inputs, measuring the outputs, measuring the greenhouse gases, looking at the loss of nitrogen from the soil and thinking about the environmental impact of where we're getting our nitrogen from. And it's looking at, uh, in the context of inorganic growing as well as organic growing. And then the perennial green manures project run by EcoDovey in Mid Wales has only just started, and that's much more much more farmer orientated, trying to get input from actual, you know, you guys doing it on the ground rather than just numbers and graphs and stuff. Um, 
So to try and explain where it's all coming from, um, mobile green manures are just when you're, you're cutting your clover or whatever from one field, adding it to another rather than plowing it into the land. And there's several advantages of doing that because you can add the right quantity at the right time because it's a bit of a blunt tool when you've got loads and loads of lush clover, lush veg, vetch or something, and you're digging it all in, you might suddenly get quite warm, wet weather and your crop might not be ready to take up all that nitrogen. And so you can get a bit of excess nitrogen building up in the soil and that can lead to inefficiencies. So a lot of growers are starting to use mobile green manures a lot more. And then the other advantage of that is that you can grow your nitrogen, grow your green manures on the, on the less prime land. So instead of putting down lays, taking prime land out of cropping, you could grow it down by the river or on higher, more exposed land and add it to your main cropping land. So there's some sort of good theoretical reasons for doing it. Um, this is a bit schooly, sorry, but nitrogen cycle. So we're kind of looking at how to avoid the losses here. So we've got uh, two different ways of the nitrogen getting into the getting into the soil, whether you're using manufactured, you know, the non-organic growers are just they're manufacturing their nitrogen with associated carbon emissions and sticking it straight into that soil mineral pool of nitrogen in the brown box. Whereas what we're doing is that we're fixing our nitrogen in plants and we're adding it into the organic box on the left. And in a good, healthy, functioning soil, you've got lots of to and fro between that organic nitrogen pool and that mineral nitrogen pool. But in order for the nitrogen to get to the crops, it does go through the mineral nitrogen pool. The organic nitrogen does get converted to ammonium and then to nitrate. And that's a form that the crops can take up the nitrogen. And when it's in that inorganic form, it, as nitrate or ammonium, it's really able to do a lot of different stuff. It can get into the roots really quickly, but it can also be lost really easily. So we don't want it to build up. We want our soil life to keep cycling the nitrogen and going drip, drip, drip into the plants, rather than in that inorganic form, it can be lost as ammonia or it can be lost as nitrous oxide, which is a really, really powerful greenhouse gas. So, so the inorganic farmers are kind of adding pre-digested nitrogen. It's all ready to go. And we're adding it into a, in a more sort of, yeah, a more three-dimensional proper form that um, feeds the soil life. But as I say, it does have to go through that. It can't, it doesn't get into the plants generally without going through being nitrate at some point. So we need to keep the system cycling really carefully. Um, so then on importing, so these talks are all about sort of farm-based providing nitrogen, your own nitrogen on farm. So most growers I know would buy in green waste compost or animal manure. And often that's a waste product. A lot of growers I know are getting it from the local donkey sanctuary. So why can there be anything wrong with that? But then when you want to scale up your growing, if we want a lot more inorganic growers to become organic mm. and we want more vegetable production, we've got to get our nitrogen from somewhere. And in that last slide, it showed that nitrogen is fixed up with those blue arrows. It's either fixed by harbour <coughs> wash, which has associated carbon emissions, or it's fixed by microbial nitrogen fixation, which takes land use, uses up land. So if you're following the nitrogen back from wherever it's come from originally, if you're adding manure to your soil, and say it's been fed by silage in the shed, then if that silage is from an inorganic farm, the nitrogen within it has caused the carbon emissions. If it's from an organic farm, then they will have to put extra land down to grow those nitrogen fixing plants. And so if you're taking it away from the land that it's come from, you're kind of using land area outside your own farm. So we should kind of be thinking about that as growers. And then on the crop fed, it's the same kind of issues. And if the farm that you're getting the manure from is imported crops from another country, we're kind of importing our nitrogen fixing from elsewhere in the world. So we're kind of, 
thinking about how we can be a bit more self-sufficient in the hydrogen. So then we're getting to why perennial, and I'm using the term perennial in a not very correct way because a lot of ordinary mobile green manures are perennial clovers and vetches and things, but I'm thinking about systems that maybe could, you know, be there for 10, 20, 50, 100,000 years, and we just keep cropping the leaves and adding it to the farmland. So I've got a bit of an idealized diagram of a farm landscape here. And we've got some inorganic land on the left and we've got some organic land on the right. So our inorganic land and that left field is being fed by harbour bosch nitrogen with the associated emissions. And then on the right, we've got it fed by our rotational lay. And that's, that farm on the right is probably a bit insulting to organic growers, sorry, because there's not many hedges and I know your farms will be better than that. But some of the big commercial ones, might not have that many trees and shrubs on it. You know, it might have a rotational lay um, and we all want more trees in our farms, I reckon. Um, so then this is all fictional, very aspirational, fictional, just ideas. Um, but then we add in some perennial mobile green manures on the hillsides and on the bottoms of the slopes. So in the inorganic farm, we've given them some, some green manures up on the hillsides where they can't grow crops. And that's replacing, we're adding some organic matter to the land there and replacing the high wash nitrogen. But on the right, what we've done is taken out that rotational nitrogen fixing lay. And I need to talk to farmers more about whether that's a good idea or not. But we've replaced it with a permanent area down by the river um, from where we're taking our grown nitrogen and also intercepted nitrogen and adding it back into the land. And we're hoping that if we do manage to design some of these systems into farms that can fulfill sort of multi-uses like wind breaks and, you know, pest predator balance, all the kind of things that, that we want to have with our biodiversity on the farm. Um, so this fits in with a lot of kind of uh, recent research and also stating the obvious that we need biodiversity for our agricultural functioning, we need more trees in the landscape. But there was an interesting paper by Poulton that kind of highlighted some of the limitations of wanting to combat climate change by increasing our soil organic matter, because um, this author looked at the amount of organic, organic matter that we've got available and a lot of it is already being put into farmland and basically saying we need more. So we need more stuff like rainy or wood or, or organic matter being harvested and produced to add to the farmland for those kind of um, solutions to work. Um, how much time? <gasps> okay, right, I've gone way, way over time. I've spent way too much explaining the first bit. So I've got, quickly got to summarize the research we did at Bangor University. And then what we're gonna do in EcoW in Mid Wales. So at Bangor University, I thought, so this is, it's only a PhD project. I thought I'd start with going back to school, seeing if I could just research, would more unusual nitrogen fixing plants fertilize the soil adequately? So I chose, I mean, there was loads of different ones to choose from. I could have done laburnum, I could have done lupins, but for whatever reason, I chose ones that grow in different habitats. I chose alder, I chose gunnera, possibly unwise, but really interesting results. And I chose gorse. And the experiments, pot and field experiments, looked at whether if you add those plants, those leaves to the soil and sow a crop, does it produce the crop efficiently? Does it result in greenhouse gases? Does it result in too much nitrate in the soil? So we did a pot trial and a field trial. Um, so in the pot trial, in both, actually in both experiments, what we did is added a three different perennial mobile green manures to the soil, sowed the crop. We've got the carbon nitrogen ratios down at the, there at the bottom because that affects the speed of the decomposition. We compared it with clover as a traditional green manure and at various rates of ammonium nitrate. And so on the left, we've got the biomass production. 
So this is over a whole year. We grew grass in these pots for a whole year, regularly cropping it. And um, we actually found that our perennial mobile green manures did pretty well in producing biomass. After a year, they did as well as the top right, AN200, the same amount of nitrogen within ammonium nitrate as within the other treatments. Um, they did pretty well and they did as well as clover. But if you were to dig down into the time within that, it was a very different pattern of the growth. So the clover and the ammonium nitrate, they released the nitrogen much, much quicker than the other plants did. And we, we think that the gunnera, the way the gunnera grew more is that it wasn't as wasteful in the early stages. So it carried on growing at a greater late later on in the year. And you can see that when we look at the nitrate levels in the soil, and then the nitrous oxide emissions that came from those nitrate levels in the soil. So the black line is ammonium nitrate fertilizer. So as you'd expect, loads of nitrate in the soil straight away. The green line is clover. So it took a little while, but then we had quite a high amount of nitrate coming from that clover into the soil. Um, but in a way, it's not a very... It doesn't happen in a normal ecosystem. You don't get suddenly get a load of lush green leaves added to your soil. So a lot of decomposition. So it was conducted in warm, wet conditions. And then, but the perennial green manures had much, much lower levels of nitrates. So the amount of nitrates being produced was about right to feed the crop. And then that did transfer into quite seriously high levels of nitrous oxide from the clover, unfortunately. Um, and that's to do with the dynamics with the carbon in the soil. Um, I'm way behind the time. So just to sum up very quickly, um, the perennial mobile green manures, they release their nitrogen much slower than the clover or the fertilizer. But we do think in the right situation, they could be feasible for fertilizing crops. They produce much, much lower nitrous oxide. Um, and gorse wasn't quite as successful as alder and gunner. But that's, we're not saying that every time you dig clover into your ground, you're producing loads of nitrous oxide. It depends on the conditions and the amount you put in and how it's used. But it is something to sort of flag up how efficient we're being with our organic materials. I'm going to skip over the pot trial, uh, the field trial, because we pretty much did the same thing out in the field to test it in real life conditions. It followed the same pattern as the crop trial, but we did find in the second year, they were much more, much better effect than the first year. So we think there's an ongoing buildup of fertility with interactions if you add them year by year. Um, am I over time now? Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> so Bangor University research, um, it highlighted a lot of other research needs. I mean, this is, you know, I don't know of anyone else using this system. So it's at the, you know, we know so little about it. And there's so many other things that we would need to try to see if it's at all feasible. But there's some of the research needs that need to happen in the future. And then what we're doing in Mid Wales now with the Perennial Green Manures Project is that we're bringing it much more into real life. So we're recruiting farmers to try this on their own plots, farmers and vegetable growers. And so we're collecting the material. We're, we'll design the trials with them for their own appropriate crops. And then later on, they'll get to plant their own um, ecological kind of bioservice areas to grow their own perennial green manures, if they decide that they think it might be a useful thing. It's right at the beginning stages. That's a kind of theoretical idea of how the systems could work, um, producing multiple ecosystem benefits. Um, and so this autumn we'll be designing trials with participant farmers and we'll get them to tell us more kind of on the ground real life things about whether it actually works for them, the other effects on their crops, um, you know, whether it causes more slugs or whatever, and, and look at the kind of practicalities of the use and energy use and carbon life cycle analysis and all that kind of thing. Um, so hopefully that kind of fits into this 
session a little bit. Um, sorry, I was very rushed. Um, Tilly is here too, our uh, project manager. So if you're in Wales, want to take part, come see us. Um, there's some references. Sorry for running over. No, oh, thank you ever so much. I'll talk while Dennis comes up. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Clo. I've seen your slides and I've chatted about it with you, but you really made it come alive. So thank you. It's really interesting. And I know with our trials at Wrighton, we've often kind of mentioned, oh, what about, I know Francis has been interested in this. So yeah, that was really, really interesting. Thank you. And um, Dennis, yeah. Get, get settled. At the... yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Dennis is going to talk about his experiences in quite a few different grain spaces in the Northwest with different soil types and different fertility inputs and things so I'll hand over to you. All right thank you so hello everyone I'm Dennis uh, I'm a grower farm star trainer at the plot and also I work at Cole part-time these days and um, so the plot is a commercial organic farm in Lancaster that also hosts the uh, the North Lancaster's farm start uh, project and it was set up by Food Futures which is we call it a network of networks that are trying to change the uh, food systems in North Lancaster and this is hosted by LESS, which is a community industry company that's been doing sustainability work for around 20 years in Lancaster. And also I'm going to talk about Clever Hill, which is a community uh, food growing project owned by the community. And we use a very specific practice to grow our crops there. So I'm gonna talk about this. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about three different growing sites in Lancaster. Um, the plot at Old Holy Farm, which is an organic dairy farm. The plot at White Land and Spat Club, which is the growing Clever Hill, is like a is again it's a big project that has uh, lots of different projects. We call it like a, a white palette, so people can come and uh, start their own project. So one of those is Spat Club, which is the food growing project. And I'm going to talk about the growing practices, how we take decisions on how to grow, and alternatives to to our inputs. So to start with, um, Lancaster is that uh, at the north of England, so it's above Manchester and just uh, below the Lake District, as you can see up there. And it rains a lot, so sometimes it rains non-stop, especially this time of the year. So it's the second most apparently the second most rainy city in the UK, about 1,000 millimeter of rain annually, which is a lot, and we flood quite often. And temperatures, well, typical UK temperatures, a little bit colder than the usual. So the plot at Old Holy Farm, Old Holy Farm is a dairy organic farm, a very innovative uh, dairy farm in Lancaster, which um, they gave us this, um, these paddocks to grow, uh, to grow vegetables. So uh, we are south of Lancaster, very south in Lancaster. As I said, we are a commercial farm and also we have farm starters. So we train uh, people that want to be growers in how to run a commercial organic farm, a certified organic farm. We are certified, we rent these four paddocks and, uh, and a packing set. So in the first year we had only this, so this is approximately 1.3 acres in total. So the first year we had only the two on the left and now we're working, we took the other two and we're working on transforming them as well. And um, so the, because there are paddocks, so they used to be before COVID, they used to be animals uh, in these fields. Organic matter is okay, it's about 7%. Uh, 7%. Our pH is 6.8, which is okay. It's heavy clay loam and our soil is very fertile. So it's sort of there are good conditions for growing crops. And our rotation, we use a four year rotation. So we rotate these four different plots every year. So for example, the brassicas this year are on the second plot, they will go on the third, the fourth, and we will rotate like this. And then in the two other paddocks, we're going to use different growing systems so we can show the farm starters basically three different ways of growing because it's not just one way of growing. We want to give them as much experience as possible. And so this is how it started. It was just grass, really hard to work with. We had to cover it with plastic to kill the grass and uh, digging a lot and removing a lot of weeds and grass. And this is how it looks now. So we have 16, uh, 16 meter long beds by 
about one meter uh, wide. And the way we, we prepare our beds at the moment is we dig the paths, uh, about six to seven meter wide paths, and uh, we dig them and put them on the bed. And uh, then we, if we want, if we need to, we add manure and lime, and then we rotate this and break the soil clumps that you can see in this picture. And then we can make, this way we can make a, a, a bed to, to grow our seedlings. And the reason why we do this is, as you can see, our beds are usually around 20 centimeters above the ground. And this is because, and in the end, so they look something like this. So our, our paths are quite low and then 20 centimeters high beds. And the way, the reason we do this is because as I said, it rains a lot in Lancaster and our feed gets flooded a lot. So by lift, by raising our beds a little bit above the ground, we have, you know, we have flood all over the field and our beds are, are okay. They don't, they don't, the water passes through and they stay, they're not flooded basically. So the plants have a, about 20 centimeters of relatively dry, not flooded soil, but relatively dry. So that's why we do this. And uh, the rotavator and digging has been really useful in our system for breaking our, our, these big soil clumps because before we had to do it manually and it would take us like a couple of days just to, to finish one bed. Uh, in terms of inputs, so we use organic cow manure uh, because, well, basically, we use it only in the heavy feeder. So basically only the brassicas because our soil is very fertile. We haven't seen any deficiencies and our crops just grow like green and less and very healthy without adding anything really other than manure in the, in the high feeders. And um, so I, I'm a proponent of vegan organic. I, I think vegan organic is the most sophisticated way to grow organic crops, but uh, we are on a daily organic farm and this is really good quality cow manure. So we use it, we, you know, the farmer just brings it to us and it's free, it's great for the crops. And um, we add lime because, and this is based on the on the pH testing that we did. And also I'm a bit paranoid with club root. So in the brassicas, I prefer to have high pH just to avoid any, any problems if they come. Um, we use, we bring past 100 green waste combos, which is great. We use it only mostly in the carrots because it's really great for the carrots. And uh, uh, one alternative could be to start making our own combos, but that's, of course, that's another, uh, you know, and it's up on its own. So, and that takes a lot of work. So we are working on it, I start working on making our own compost, but at the moment we use past 100. We use Mybex, we use plastic, and with Organic Plus, we try to see alternatives to plastics like bioplastic and loose mulches, but really we found that Mybex is really, if you, if you treat it well, it lasts for ages and really works. So it is plastic, but it's, it's a really useful tool. And of course we use wood chip because I think wood chip is gold. We use it everywhere in the past, on our beds, we compost it and it's free and it's a great, great material to have. And of course we use petrol for the rotavator, which um, we try to use it as little as possible, uh, but it's, it's a really useful, really useful tool. So that's about our dairy, uh, the plot of the dairy farm. The other side is in the Serban Changi, which is in Morecambe, just outside Lancaster. Uh, it's this polytunnel, it's a 500 square meter uh, double span polytunnel. So this area there in the industrial estate is owned by the council and they used to grow bedding plants before, uh, before COVID for the council, but with COVID they stopped having staff going, you know, no one was allowed to go there to take care of the plants. So they stopped and now they just buy plants from outside. So they've given us this polytunnel and we started growing food in it. So, but it's been a challenge. So there's lots of stones. This is the first day in the polytunnel. So for, for about 20 years, this polytunnel has been three minutes already. Okay. It has been covered with my pegs, only growing Potting plants in pots, in pots. Um, so there's lots of silences, lots of stones. We even uh, lifted the mypex and found the road under the mypex, the gravel road. Uh, pH is uh, yeah, above 10 in some spots. So yeah, the road was under this mypex and we transformed it into this. 
slowly, slowly uh, using Clover, using green manure, using a lot of wood seed that is available at the council. That's another picture. Um, so we are in conversion. This is the second year now. And we are, for this project, we put our like regenerative hat on and we're trying to, we're looking at it as a degraded land and trying to restore it, trying to increase organic matter, soil life, green manures, composting, and aerobic digestate. We're doing minimal digging here, not as a philosophy, but because it's impossible to dig that soil. It will just break our backs and our rotavator and everything. So we just let the, basically, we let the roots of the green manures and the plants do the, do the job. So this is how we decided this. But with all this and all, you know, pH above 10 and all these stones, we didn't observe any worrying deficiencies, which is really interesting. So in terms of our inputs, green manures, they're great making the soil, bringing as Chloe said, all about, I don't need to say anything else actually. We use Mybex again, an alternative is the wood chip that again, we can get from the council for free. And, and we use an aerobic uh, liquid tomato feed this year, we bought it and that to increase soil microbial activity and to feed the tomatoes. But next year we're gonna start making our own confit tea, and the last project is Clever Hill. And so Clever Hill is a community growing project on community owned land. So we recently bought, we've been running for 10 years and we recently uh, collected money and bought the land. And we do no dig gardening. Uh, we're not certified organic. And the field, of course, where in Lancaster was, it used to be very prone to flooding. So it, in, at this time of the year, it used to be always flooded, but um, one thing that we did, we did natural uh, flood management system. So we have a, a series of ponds. I don't know if you can see there is a pond there next to the road. So there's a series of ponds around the side that are connected to the canal. And they all um, concentrate in this big pond that we have at the side of the project. And this way we managed to control our flooding and our water, uh, how the water flows on the farm. But also we've been using no dig farming, uh, no dig gardening. And these beds, they have been amazing in terms of non-flooding. So for 10 years, we were growing no dig here. And when before we had the flood management system, the field used to be flooded, but the beds were always dry and they always look really healthy. So this approach is great for flooding places. Um, so we chose no dig. It's a sort of, uh, so it's because it's easy, basically, because we work with members and volunteers. So no dig, there's no digging, just people carrying uh, horse manure and uh, mushroom compost with uh, the wheelbarrows, uh, leaving it on the bed, spreading it. And also it's this idea that it's better for the soil. But after 10 years I've started, and we started in general, like thinking, are we sure it's better for the soil? I mean, we need to look more into that and uh, yeah, understand more if it's better, it's not just, yeah, it's much more complex, basically. Uh, so that's why I put the question mark. So basically, yeah, the practice that we use is we put up around uh, four to six centimeters of compost across the bed and plant directly into the into the compost, which, yeah, it's looked okay for 10 years. Um, but in terms of inputs, the inputs are massive, especially when comparing it with uh, what we do at the plot. So we use mushroom compost from the local mushroom farm. Uh, which is essential for no dig. You can't, if you don't bring a lot of compost, you can't do this specific no dig system. And we use 10 tons, around 10 tons for one acre of land a year of mushroom compost. Uh, and another, an alternative we started uh, looking at is actually starting making our own compost, but it will be really hard to produce this amount of compost to sustain this no dig system. Again, we use MyPEX, wood chip. And there's lots of people. There's lots of people coming on the farm, weeding, doing stuff, sitting. And uh, so that system needs a lot of, so we basically, we, in a way we have replaced the rotavator with people or the other way around. So wrapping up, there's no one, uh, there's no one size fits all. Every site is different. As growers, I think we need to look at as many as possible approaches we can and just do a fusion and do what works on our side with our um, our conditions it's very complex and have to take people into account and the well-being of people the well-being of the soil and yeah and uh, 
certified or not, it's always useful to look at the organic standards. So uh, they're there for a reason. And there, you know, there's a lot of lots of evidence-based knowledge on them. So it's always use, useful to look at, at our inputs and calibrate them with the standards, even if we are, you know, if we not, don't want to be organic fair enough, but it's always good. Yeah, to check our inputs. And yeah, it's really useful to monitor our inputs closely. And it's much easier, it's very easy to apply more fertilizer than what is needed. And I'm always surprised by how much, how much little is really needed to grow good quality organic crops. So thank you. Thank you, Dennis, really interesting again, and just the diversity of things that you're working with in the range of, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Francis. Yeah. Yes. Oh, wrong way. All right then. I'm um, going to tell you a bit about the work that we've been doing at Coventry University um, as part of the this Organic Plus project that um, that Judith introduced earlier on. See, there's a, quite a crowd of us being involved in this in, in one way or another. Um, I thought we'd just begin briefly by thinking, we're talking about like building fertility, but what we're we really trying to achieve by that, because it means so many different things. Um, I mean, in the first instance, it is making sure that your crops have got enough nutrients, especially N, P and K, but obviously all the, the trace elements as, as, as well as that. Um, it's important to maintain the um, adequate fit pH. Um, both for the um, for the benefit of the plants, but also for all the microbiology in the soil as well. Um, and then kind of coming on to organic matter, there's really two sides to it, which aren't necessarily the same thing. One of them is that you need to have enough organic matter to sustain the, the biological life in the soil, to ensure the nutrient cycling, to ensure that the, um, the various elements that plants required are are provided so so that's um that that that's very important um but you know that there, there's there's organic matter and there's organic matter some of it is um you know we've heard about the green manures that are put in that's very that can be very short term it kind of quite rapidly decomposes others is there you know literally for a thousand years it's like really really stable it's associated with the um you know the kind of the 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 soil particles. So it's it's not all it's not all one thing by any means. Um, and then in the second aspect of organic matter is obviously you need it also to ensure a good soil structure, the kind of the physical characteristics of the soil. Um, and it's often said, you know, that kind of whatever your soil problems are, if you add organic matter to it, it will all be solved. But this does raise the question, is, is it possible to have too much organic matter? So, of course, some soils are entirely organic matter, um, peaty soils. There's kind of there's nothing else. And um, and, and that's so it's, it's, it's kind of a, an interesting thing. Maybe be interesting if we get to the discussion to hear what your, your views are. Just moving on, um, just to sort of think about soil testing. I think one of the big questions is it's all very well safe having your soil tested, but what do you have it tested for? And in particular, do you really know what the answers mean? Because often people get a big sheet of results back and and, and kind of knowing how to interpret it adequately is, is one of the, um, the, uh, the the important things. And also, which kind of comes from the soil testing, if you find that you've got really high levels of um, particular nutrients, particularly something like excess of uh, phosphorus, supposedly can inhibit the uptake of various trace elements like iron and zinc. Um, that's kind of what's said. Does it really happen? It'd be interesting to know if, if any of you have had actual experiences <laughs> of this and sort of kind of ev ev evidence for it, because that's something that maybe it'd be interesting to do more, more research on to, to investigate. So just um, briefly to say about some experiments that we did within the Organic Plus project, and we, we needn't get too bogged down in the detail of it, but there is our polytunnel that we had newly built, and our idea at the beginning of the project was we would look at the benefits of various sorts of feeding um, for a tomato crop. Um, 
and this was kind of identified in the proposal. This is something that we would look at. We decided we'd focus particularly on vegan organic inputs, things that could be produced on farm, avoiding the use of animal mures, which were considered contentious because particularly if they're conventional because of the um, um, dependency on, on, on the conventional system and for various other reasons as well. So we, we marked out our, our Try our trial there. We applied different different sorts of feeds: country liquid, bean liquid. We also use bean powder. Um, and here are some pictures of us doing it. There's there's Dennis again making the uh, making the making the brew of country liquid, and we and we grew tomatoes as a test crop. Um, but really, and the interesting thing was that no matter what we applied, all of the tomatoes all grew really well. Um, which from a kind of a, I don't know, we were very disappointed with this from a, from a sort of academic scientific viewpoint, but of course what we wanted was to have like massive differences that we could say, ah, oh, we applied substance X and that, that really did the trick. Um, none, of the, none of what we applied had an effect neither on the tomato crop. After the tomatoes, um, we grew in the, the following year, we grew pak choy as another cash crop, again, no effect. We grew phacelia as a green manure, no difference in the, in the biomass of that. So, uh, so from a, a, a scientific point of view, it was, it was disappointing. What we did, what we did do, we measured, we did also measure some other, other kind of parameters. We looked particularly at the mineral nitrogen in the soil. Um, and indeed, you can see it went, we, we measured, there, there were other times we measured it as well. We did it sort of various strategic dates at kind of the, the planting or the harvesting of the various crops. And it went up and down, you know, as the crops utilized it and then their residues broke down and, and became available. Um, so again, we need to focus on the detail. But what is interesting is in, in almost every case, the control plots that we didn't apply anything to, they did have the lowest concentrations of, um, of available nitrogen. So even though we didn't see the benefits of the extra in the crops, there was, there was obviously something that was coming out of, the, uh, out of the different feeds that we were adding. But that's, yeah, so, so you, you, and that kind of is an indication in the, in the broader sense, it was disappointing for us. But it does show that, there, that, that these feed in this set of circumstances, feeding brought no benefits. The background soil fertility was sufficient. Kind of moving on from that, of course, you know, it, it's, it's good to have biological activity. That's a, that's a, a thing that's, that's, you know, everyone kind of agrees with having a, a lively soil. And this is an, an, a, some measurements that we made, not actually in that physical same space. This is another another tunnel that we did some work in. And so you can see the actual treatments here are a little bit different. We had our control that we didn't apply anything to. We had some plots that we under sowed as lentils. We had some plots that we applied this bean flour to and actually raked it into the soil. And we also used comfrey, but as a mulch rather than applying it directly to the soil. And what we did was we measured the respiration. We poked these little um, chambers in, in made out of a drain pipe, so they weren't as high tech as Chloe's that we saw um, in the earlier one. But we, um, we pushed them into the ground and we sucked out the, um, the air and measured the carbon dioxide over a period of time. And the interesting thing was that where we'd applied the bean flour, we did have significantly elevated levels of respiration, even though the bean flour had been applied weeks and weeks before. Um, it did have a, a, a did have a stimulating effect on the um, on the soil microbiology. So uh, even if it wasn't having a beneficial effect on on the yield of the crops, it was it was clearly doing something in encouraging the uh, in encouraging the soil life, enhancing the, the activity of the soil organisms. And so I think this whole area is something that really needs more explanation. I think. Um, it, it's it, it's it, it is still a kind of a, a bit of a mystery exactly what's going on when you add these materials and exactly how the how the fertility is is maintained in the soil. Um, just um, to say briefly, this is um, some work would, again done by one of our colleagues in the Organic Plus project, but a few years previously, um, Sabine Zikali and, and some of her colleagues, um, and they published a paper um, in which they'd 
done a survey of um, organic farmers in Germany, and this is kind of particularly protected cropping. So it was both greenhouses and polytunnels, and they'd they'd drawn up nutrient budgets from these um, from these farmers, and they they had and they were looking at them in two groups. They that some of them were certified by. Um, uh, Bio land, so they were might, what you might call, you know, well, <laughs> conventional or, or 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 more typical perhaps of uh, of organic farmers. Um, with, uh, they generally didn't have livestock because um, these are sort of again sort of relatively intensive horticultural holdings, um, and they tended to use branded fertilizers they tended to bring in either legume meal hoof and horn things like that sort of products that they use for maintaining their fertility and that was in contrast to the um the demeter people who generally were perhaps you might say part of a more integrated system um and used much more manures and compost so there was, even though they were all organic there were these two sort of distinct strategies to them they were all it was and this is kind of a quite a big story if you're interested it you, you can you can get the paper or if you can't get it we can perhaps forward it to you um, because there are interesting differences again between some of them had heated systems kind of glass houses cropping year round some of them just had tunnels grown at you know, sort of in summer crops only. The rotations are very varied, but the tomatoes were kind of the common theme. And the, but the important thing is that in all of, on each and every one of these farms, regardless of what their sort of underlying philosophies were and their, whether they were heated or not, um, in each case, the nutrient, ba ba nutrient balances were very unbalanced. There was generally an excess of nitrogen and of phosphorus and sulfur, but a, a lack of um, a lack of potassium. So this kind of indicates that these systems aren't really perhaps as sustainable as as, as people might might hope they are. And there was also generally a buildup of alkalinity um, in in the in these tunnels and greenhouses and also um, a buildup of salinity and salinity obviously isn't generally considered to be a, a, a problem in, in in northern europe but um, perhaps it can be in a in a tunnel where there isn't this sort of excess of rainfall to, to to wash that salt out particularly when they were they were bringing in all this quantity of materials into an enclosed space. So, so that's interesting to see that that kind of um, that story from from Germany. Um, and it would be interesting to do a similar exercise in the UK to see if there are there are kind of similar sort of patterns here. Um, and Joe, just to sum up briefly, I think you, the main point is that soil fertility can't can't be taken for granted. It's important to consider if there is an actual problem though um, and and to address it accordingly to think what the um, what the problem is is it a lack of organic matter is it a lack of nitrogen is it a lack of a particular trace element what what is the actual problem rather than just taking a kind of a blanket approach of thinking just pile in a load of compost and everything will be all right um, i think it's important whenever possible to make use of um, green manure nitrogen or, or kind of nitrogen from plants because as, as as we saw in the in the talk about the mobile green manures that is one way of bringing in predominantly nitrogen without bringing in an excess of these these other nutrients because that is just kind of plant foliage so that's that's the kind of thing to do obviously it's difficult sometimes in a in kind of protected cropping but this sort of mobile green manures idea is is one good way in which that could that could be addressed. And then, although I've just said about these budgets which were unbalanced, um, and so you might say, well, that's all that's all bad. It, it's also very important to think when these nutrients will be available, because you can have a perfectly balanced budget, but there can be times in the year when the nutrients are just not available in sufficient quantities. So it's that's particularly the case with nitrogen. So so thinking when the nutrients will be available as well. And finally, remembering when the uh, the you know the remembering the importance of the physical and the biological aspects of fertility, you know, the microbial activity, is the soil 
um, soft enough to plant your crops in. Obviously, Dennis had a real problem in his um, in his tunnel there that he took over from the uh, from the council. And so, kind of thinking of ways of loosening it is cultivations. Is that the most appropriate way, or is going for like a no dig mulching on top approach? You know, that that's the, all those things need to be thought of thought of together. Um, and we'd like to hear, you know, when we get to the discussion, we'd like to hear hear your views on those. And finally, thank you for your attention. Right, thank you very much, Francis. So I think, Tolly, you're our final speaker, and then hopefully we should have about 15 minutes left for discussion. <laughs> Right, hello. Yeah, um, I inherited a farm, but I didn't inherit it, I wish. Um, <clears throat> I took on a farm 35 years ago, um, and it's here, I hope, somewhere. Where's my farm gone? Here we go. Um, it was the opposite of what we've been hearing about in terms of very low fertility. It's been heavily managed by Maybe hay cropping for 30, 40 years, and perhaps since the war. So, very low in, in nutrients. Um, organic matter was relatively low. It's a very difficult soil type. It's a grade three B and grade four land. So, it's by no means what you call good quality land. We had a very interesting opportunity arise this year as a result of quite a bit of publicity we received about the farm and the way we, we managed the farm because we managed it with virtually no inputs at all during this time. Uh, a company called Agri Carbon came forward. And they wanted to have a good look at our farm, gone the wrong way, um, in terms of looking at the carbon content. They'd never actually heard of a farm that had been intensely producing vegetables over so many decades, three and a half decades, with virtually no inputs at all. So this to them was quite an interesting proposition. Now, AgriCarbon are a company set up in Scotland by a, a farmer who are looking at deep carbon. They go right the way down to the meter. So we're not looking at organic matter in the top few inches, but looking really right the way down through the, the soil profile. So they came along with this machine. This machine was developed by, by the guy who set the company up. He was watching the, the Earth, no, not the Earth, the Mars Rover program some years ago on TV. And he saw this huge machine going tunneling across Mars, taking these core samples of rock. He said, well, doing this on Mars, why are we not doing this on Earth? So he actually somehow managed to talk these people and let them have a, a copy of the plans. He built a machine, which is almost identical to the Mars rover machine, put this very intense probe on the back, which literally goes down to a meter deep in, in seconds, apart from our last so it took longer because they're mostly rock, um, and takes out a beautiful core. The core is one meter long, and an inch and a half diameter in a, in a plastic tube. And you can, it's rather like looking at an ice geological ice pattern where you can go right way down through the soil, looking at all your soil levels, right the way down to and be so deep. And the idea of this really was to measure carbon right the way down through the soil profile. This, uh, this was done during the summer. It was hugely disruptive. They took um, several hundred core samples from our fields. But the opportunity also arose, arose that we could also look at my neighbor's farm who has been organic for as long as I have, in fact, like longer. But the difference being he's been on permanent pasture, whereas we've been on very intensive organic vegetables. Back in my mind over all this time, despite, despite the fact we could see soil fertility improving, was this kind of worrying, nagging doubt that maybe our carbon was getting depleted and we were mining long-term carbon reserves. So we were really interested to see what results we got from, from this soil test. Um, I'm not going to go into all the figures because this gets really boring, but you can always come back to it and look at it later. But what they were doing really was looking at the whole farm. And you can see on the left hand, on the right hand side there, we've got two controls, one north, one south, they're both the same soil type. So we're able to compare like with like, identical soil type, but different long term management regime. And looking at soil organic carbon, which is different from organic matter, soil organic carbon is a much longer term, much more stable form of organic matter. And they're going right down where they could, down to a meter deep. In some places on some of our land, which is incredibly stony, they couldn't get a meter deep. What we've come up with in terms of the total carbon stock um, amounts to 136 mature oak trees. It's kind of useful to think of it in that term because 
80 odd tons of carbon per hectare, which is what we have, doesn't mean much unless you can actually visualize it in a real life form. And they put it in the, in the, in the sense of trees, which makes it really user friendly. So each plot of our field, we had the opportunity to look at every year of our rotation. We have a seven year rotation because I want to know what differences were from year to year, different rotations, different crop regimes. So they went through the whole farm, not going to show the whole lot because it's too much of it. But what they were looking at primarily was the soil carbon content, but also soil fault density, which is a measurement of how compact or otherwise your soil is. As I say, if you want to come back to these figures, they, they will be available. Uh, what we found in general was that we had um, a very interesting um, situation where we had around between 80 and 87 tonnes of carbon per hectare. Uh, and this put it at quite high. This is quite high for, for land of this type. And we had a bulk density, which was around between 1.1 and 1.4, which means it's actually very well drained. It's very, it's very friable. It means that roots can penetrate. It's the ideal fraction for soil density. This kind of gives you a, an overall overview of the whole soil analysis from all the different plots. So we're going from left to right, we're looking at our fields. In the middle, we have the two, the two control fields, and these are the long-term permanent grass. And at the very end, we have one which I put question marks on, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But you can see the upper line is, is the, the higher element, the lower line is the median one, and below that is considered low. So we are, apart from one plot, we are within the medium or high range. But interestingly, the control is virtually no difference in terms of statistical analysis, the difference is so slight as to be probably insignificant. So what we've seen primarily, and I was quite excited, I'm still getting my head around these figures because they are quite complex, but what we've seen is that over 35 years, a very intense management where we are producing around, um, it's about 14 tonnes per hectare per year of food, we have managed to maintain that carbon level in comparison to our neighbouring farmer who has been producing long-term grass and a much lower amount of food. This was a big encouragement. Whoops, where have I gone? <laughs> um, right, so the control clearly shows that we've, you know, we're on the right sort of trajectory. We're not mining our carbon, we've maintained our carbon. We have some which is slightly higher. We have one which is much lower. And one which is much lower is the one they couldn't do a proper soil core on because it was very dry, hadn't been irrigated, they couldn't get the depth, they hadn't picked up all the carbon, which is why that one plot was very low. Interestingly, the plot which is in long-term green manure, which is two years, which is um, number, number three along there, um, was also showing quite a high level of carbon. So the differences between the different years within the rotation are incredibly slight. And that was also very encouraging. The idea of measuring carbon is not something you can do every year because you need a relatively long period of time to really get the information through. So it's recommended you do it perhaps every five to 10 years. It's a long, a long-term process. So what we've ended up with is yet more figures and looking down through the depth here, where they're measuring down at different levels, they go 150 and then another 150 and another 150 and then down to the bottom, which is a meter, if they could get it in and measuring the soil organic carbon at those points. And interestingly, we often showed, compared with the long-term perennial field, we often showed slightly higher carbon levels lower down in the soil, which is good news because carbon is much safer. The deeper you put it, the safer it is. Um, the final slide, I think, on this part of the presentation is really, what is it? Hang on, um, I've already done this. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we've ended up with these 136 mature oak trees. Let's get this right. Oh. <laughs> well, I've done that. Maybe the battery's gone. Yeah, I just put most of the cells for a minute. <laughs> Do you warm them up? Have <laughs> you got any batteries? Oh, oh, oh. 
No. Hang on. Okay. I'm just going to restart it. Oh. Keep going. Sorry, it's a different. Um, it's a different chat and tone. Not okay. <clears throat> right, here we go. Keep going. And again. Right, stop. Right, so the average total, the average total soil organic carbon was around eighty tons, between seventy nine and eighty seven tons per hectare, which is twelve fully grown oak trees per hectare. And this is a picture of our field with brassicas. In the background is two fully grown oak trees. They were planted in around 1680. They consider those are what you call a fully grown oak tree. So if you can imagine 12 and a half oak trees per hectare, that's how much carbon we have in our soil. It's a lot of carbon. And the idea with our farm system is that we will maintain that carbon and hopefully increase it very slightly. There is room to put more in. However, carbon sequestration is not a simple thing to do on farms when you're exploiting, as we do really in a way, for vegetable production. Vegetable production takes the most out of the soil of any possible crop. That includes both carbon and nutrients. So the idea that we can actually accumulate or at least maintain carbon levels and very slightly improve it over a period of time is really encouraging. So we know we don't have to put massive inputs into this farm to maintain the carbon level. We're doing it primarily with plants, plant-based agriculture, and a few trees which produce wood chip. So it's a really useful way of looking at how long-term fertility will be maybe viewed in the future when we forget about how much we need to put into soil because all soils are capable of sustaining themselves if you manage them in the right way provided you get the biological activity right you get the microfauna working for you you don't need to put huge amounts of material in providing you maintain that carbon level that's the critical factor right next one right i've got probably five minutes left uh stop through about standards uh we've had a kind of a rebound for stop through about standards because it's been around a long time no one's heard about it um, I've been doing it for, I can't remember, maybe 16, 17 years. Um, it's really about reducing the need to bring inputs from outside the farm. So we have excluded all livestock systems, primarily initially for practical reasons, but it's now become more important than that. Um, no livestock food is grown. We don't produce any food on the farm. This is in line with the standards. We don't kill wild animals. Um, there are derogations allowed if you do need to have some intervention, but they are definitely derogations. No importation of animal manures. We're not bringing in ghost acres from somewhere else, someone else's land, which we would be perhaps bringing in. No livestock byproducts, which would include material going into substrates. Uh, and as far as possible, really trying to maintain the fertility of the farm from within the farm itself. Uh, there is a conversion period, which is relatively short and substitutes free of animal inputs. Next one. <clears throat> um, yeah, so why, why do it? It's um, a lot of growers, and we've heard some of the problems already face growers in terms of bringing nutrients in, in terms of uh, possible potential pollutions, but also in terms of bringing in these ghost acres, which I keep talking about. And then there's animal welfare issues, which people also have concerns about too. So to try and exclude some of these problems from the farm is perhaps a good thing for some of us. Next one. Uh, finally, um, so go and stop through a gate. How would you do it? And there are people who have done this and, and are doing it. You need to be certified already uh, at the moment with the Soil Association, but that will be changing in the future as well. Uh, no animal inputs, so you're not allowed to use any animal inputs on the farm. Uh, improved soil health through green manures, compost, round your chip wood, developing rotations to optimize soil. And rotations are key to what we do. We could not have done what we have on the farm if we hadn't employed some quite complex rotations. And managing pest and disease through a systems approach. The systems approach is critical for pest and disease control and fertility in keeping that carbon level up, this is a critical factor. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ian. Yeah, another really interesting angle. And I didn't thank Francis, actually, but um, I think maybe because I work with him. <laughs> and I have to say the tomato yield, big yield, wasn't all bad, because we all quite like tomatoes. But yeah. Right, I'm going to hand over to Donna. Um, We've got some research questions.
coming. <laughs> we haven't got our slide. There it is. Oh, it's gone. It might come back in a minute. Well, this is the chance for me to uh, engage with you guys and uh, basically um, ask you what you feel we should look at next. So just to kick off that conversation. Yay, that's me. So um, just to say, first of all, absolutely do um, either contact us or look at, uh, up that Sakeli paper that uh, Francis just uh, put some of his, um, did some of his presentation on. It's a really good and fascinating paper and it's absolutely worth you know, 20 minutes going through that. Um, and uh, I drew a lot of our future potential research questions from that paper. Uh, so I was gonna go through those with you, but really I want to engage with you guys and find out what you would like us to do because we would really like to respond to, to you and uh, hopefully put some bits together, win some money, millions, uh, and uh, do some research that's useful. So, uh, so go, going from the Sikaley paper, some of the questions I came up with is, uh, is there a buildup of key elements in composted protected systems? Uh, what is the financial yield and the environmental cost of this buildup? What is the fate of N in intensively compost systems? When do key elements become available from compost degradation? What gas losses are there? How much compost is actually needed is a very pertinent question, especially in regard to the last two um, presentations. For what crops, when should it be applied to maximize yield, reduce cost and environmental impact? Does bi oh, biochar, sorry, I forgot to explain that. I'm a carbon scientist, so biochar is my baby. So I thought I'd just slide that one in here and just bring it to your attention. But is there something we can do with biochar or charcoal to help reduce any imbalances in the system? And how would we develop a set of regulations for organic growing in protected systems? And one of the things that the Sikaley uh, paper really uh, highlights is, um, which I would like to add to this, is the amount of knowledge it takes and the requirement for testing. So I come from a farming background myself um, and I can tell you for generations we did what we'd always done, what our grandfathers had done and great grandfathers had done. Um, so it's really difficult to actually step out of that and think right am I doing the right thing you know and test and then be able to understand uh, what the, the results of that test tells you. So what I wanna throw open to you guys now is what would you like us to find out? Can I take your question first, sir? Uh, Pete, Pete Richardson, um, commercial organic growth for 30 years. Um, a lot of us, whether, sorry, within the last two or three years, we've been having a debate within the organic world, horticulture generally about soil obesity and that kicked off in Bristol a few years ago and um, we've been debating it ever since so my request because of the amount of gardeners and commercial growers that are transitioning to no dig and mint till is that we research and we haven't got the funds unfortunately uh, the OGA um, we, we've been debating it within the OJ for, for a while now, but we really, really do need some hard evidence about how much compost we should be putting on because Tolly kickstarted this some years ago and we, we would really appreciate that research. We, it would give us a lot of backing for what we're doing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. That indeed is what Francis and Tolly and I have been discussing and that's what we want to go forward with. So um, actually, if I can take your details later, it'd be really good to get for us to build the bid and then say, is this what you want? Because obviously you will have understandings and nuances that we don't have as uh, you know, growers and researchers. Next question, that gentleman there, please. Thank you. Hi, it's Mark Measures. I've uh, recently done a Churchill Fellowship looking at soil management and, um, and, and monitoring. And um, I think um, a key to this question is developing better methods of assessing and analysing soils and understanding how to interpret the results. Because um, I have reviewed all of the different analysis systems and I can tell you that they all have major shortcomings in terms of how we manage the soil from an organic perspective. 
Um, and although there are some interesting avenues to pursue in alternative soil analysis techniques, um, they are largely untested. And uh, we have to at the moment fall back on um, very basic conventional analytical techniques. So that would be my, my plea. Um, and I think just to pick up on, on Tolly's fascinating work on soil carbon, and I should say in soil, he, he was giving soil carbon and not soil organic matter levels, so don't confuse the two. Um, but um, the crucial thing is that um, he was measuring it to a sufficient depth to give you a meaningful result and with a frequency to give you a meaningful result because frankly, most of the claims that I see about increases in soil organic matter levels over periods of time are complete nonsense because they're not properly sampled, they're not reliably analyzed and they don't mean anything at all. So beware. Great, thank you very much. We'll certainly include that. I don't know if this is a research question or just a question that I don't know the answer to, but as someone who uses a lot of clovers and nitrogen fixing crops in rotations, I want to know how do I know that I'm not putting too much nitrogen in because I never see a shortage of nitrogen in my system, I see a shortage of P and K. I worry, is it possible to overdo nitrogen through clover and through nitrogen fixing crops? Uh, I might hand over to the expert on that one, i.e. Francis. Um, I, think, but... I think Chloe's got better. Oh, Chloe's got... Oh, oh, you're on the spotlight now, Chloe. Well, um, that was kind of well, what you looked at, wasn't it? That's what my research showed. You know, it was possible. There was huge amounts of nitrate in the soil and huge amounts of nitrous oxide emissions. Um, but that was deliberately an extreme case in my research is looking at a worst case scenario. But I think I think that's an excellent research question that you suggest because although I know I now know how to overdo it and produce a load of greenhouse gases by adding clover, I don't know what exactly is the right amount. And I can envisage systems where you can add, you know, some green manure that decompose slowly at the beginning of the system and then top it up throughout the year with some clover, dry clover, palleted clover as and when it's needed. But how to really judge how much you add. So I'm thinking when. of like living. No, I'm, I'm under thinking of the mobile green manures. But when you, if you're sowing your clover direct and then digging it in, you know, well, it could. Theoretically, you could add too much if you're going to get a warm, wet spell and your crop's a bit slow growing. I don't see, you know, it seems entirely feasible. So you might want to top it before you dig it all in and save a bit for later. But those questions on, you know, that's a, you know, growing skill that I yeah. don't have. Those questions on exactly what the right amount is. Um, I think it's different every year as well. Yeah. That's the problem of knowing and like the availability because. You might, if the conditions are right and it all mineralizes within a fortnight or in another year, you might do the same thing. It, it might not. It's very rare to go to any organic vegetable grower and see nitrogen deficiency. Yeah. Most, most people put in too much on it. And it's the main fetish of growers. Like so I'm sorry to give you the usual scientific answer, but the answer is it depends. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> But it is a really good research question is how do we find out a really good usable system, discover a usable system through which you can monitor your nitrogen requirements and your nitrogen deficit or your nitrogen excess, and then what you do about it. So this is years of research we're talking about because it'll depend on the soil, the crop, where you are, if it's rainy or sunny. Um, but it's certainly something that we could look to include some future bid work. So thank you very much. Uh, is that is that working? Yeah, I think so. Hello. Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> I've got a three-parter in research questions. It might just be questions. My first one was for Francis. The fact that there was just 
good tomatoes all round. I would I would be curious to know if there was any difference, particularly in terms of micronutrients in the contents of the tomatoes based on which inputs they'd received whilst they were growing, if any were sort of nutritionally stronger um, in terms of content. Just you want so, me to answer that. Sorry? I, well, we, we did keep all the samples, but we haven't tested them yet. Okay. So, <laughs> so the answer could come. We didn't eat them all. <laughs> um, my second one was um, now um, with the invention of the kind of microbiometer, there is more possibility to kind of test soil biology. Um, I'm assuming you think it's a robust testing mechanism. I don't know on farm, and it would be really interesting to to maybe set up a trial with farmers, kind of looking at some of these systems and their impact on soil biology, particularly kind of across a, a field system where you might have kind of additives at the edge, or like in an agroforestry, or um, the field to link the microbiology with um, crop quite a build on on Mark's question about just because you can do tests doesn't mean they're valuable um and then I suppose my final thing for, for me um would be with all these additions that you can do would be testing them against um extreme uh, weather events particularly in light of climate change anything that means that the crops are more likely to get through uh, flooding or drought I would have thought would be a kind of priority research area yeah definitely thank you very much for that that's certainly again something we can think to include and we'll need to I think I'm very similar questioning. Okay, thank you. That's a really good point. Um, we, we are the Centre for Agroecology, Water and Resilience, but we also look at the social aspects of what we do. So we would be, we always try to, because we end up with huge projects, but look at food quality, but also uh, the social side of things as well. They, in terms of what growers and farmers can actually do, keeping them financially viable and safe and healthy and uh, helping to protect the environment and grow good food and look after our soils. So we try to do everything. So we'll certainly be included in that. Hey, yeah, I was just so we've been some experience with um, strip tillage and under sows, and just maybe because having a yeah, for a, a doing it underneath crops or alongside the actual cropping and not before. Yeah, that, that's one of the limitations that we are up against is the, one of the things that Sir Kayleigh, uh points out is that they don't want to include, because uh, the Kayleigh's on a closed systems protected cropping, and you don't always have the room to include a lay um, all the time or the finances. So that's one of the things that we will need to include in our, in our future projects. I think there's one at the back as well, was there? Hi, um, I think I'd also be quite interested in um, impact of the treatment of the soil. We kind of talked a lot about putting compost on and um, kind of intensively composted systems. And um, myself personally, kind of a fan of green manures and cover crops, but just also um, a lot of these research questions are based on the impact of that input, but also what happens, how you treat that soil. For me, like the aggregation of the soil is where all that carbon sequestration happens in the life and the biology. So are you looking at that alongside how you're treating the soil as well as what's going into it? Yes, yeah, so you're talking about techniques and methodologies as well as inputs. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, one more at the back. 
Hi, um, I don't really understand carbon sequestration that much, but I know that like different management practices can affect how much carbon is in the soil or get sequestered. So what varieties of crops do the most sequestration or what management practices are best? Um, I might ask Tolly to answer that. Well, our question is very few crops will sequester any at all if you're taking that crop away. So, you know, the idea of growing a crop and sequestering carbon is something that's going to happen. I mean, I'm getting slightly nervous about the word sequestration now because it's been overused. Suddenly, farmers are working out the idea that possibly you can take, you know, nearly all the atmospheric carbon and put it back in the soil. You're not. This isn't going to happen. You know, you can put a little bit of that. You're going to put so much in. You have a, a jug, you put so much water in, it's full up, it's full. You cannot carry on dumping carbon into soil forever. So I think that's one of the problems that I see happening. People think this is going to happen on farms. Some will, but not to anything like the extent we're expecting. So did I answer questions or did I go off on a bit of What was the question again? <laughs> Um, I think you were just trying to find out what uh, methods and also right. plants create um, carbon sequestration. The thing, that, the thing that puts carbon back better than anything else is longevity. Yeah. So trees, you know, we're talking very long periods of time, but, you know, green years will put some back and get it right and leave them in the ground for long enough. But, I mean, you have to have, you have to accept that you could not continue to crop land with crop offtake forever. You have to have periods of restoration and periods of recuperation and time within that rotation. For us, we have two and a half years, we don't crop at all, we're putting carbon back. So partly through green years, but also through tree crops, which we're growing on the farm to, to supplement that carbon. Tree crops are the best way of putting carbon back. Can I to add something as well? No, go on and that's to say, of course, if you grow green manure and you're wanting the green manure to provide you're wanting it to break down and release the nitrogen, particularly to feed the following crops. And so in that breaking down process, it releases carbon dioxide. It, you know, all, the, all that soil life is the microorganisms breathing. And that's kind of considered to be a good thing, which is, well, that's, so, that's microbial activity. That's what you want. But it's also anti-sequestration. Okay, I've got time for one more question. So, okay, yeah, okay can, who's next? Do you know? Did anybody can I have that gentleman again in the middle? Thank you. That, this will be my last question before I round up. Sorry, it's not a question. It's only to say that there are very well established methods of improving organic matter levels in soil. And I should just pick up on one because the long term 30 year trials in Switzerland on organic and conventional and biodynamic uh, rotations, uh, the, the, the one of the uh, practices that seem to indicate the greatest improvement in soil organic matter levels was by uh, properly composting the manures rather than adding them fresh. And that seemed to stabilize the organic matter and add a little bit to long term organic matter accumulation. Okay, thank you very much. So to, uh, sorry if there's any more questions, we can't take them now, we have to draw to a close, but please get in contact with the centre or any of the guys if you've got any more burning issues. But just to bring it all together again, um, thank you very much uh, for coming to listen to us. I uh, hope you found uh, what we had to say of interest, and we really hope that we spend the next few years researching what's vital to you, and uh, I hope you've had a really nice session. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.